Hello, I'm Mike Chinoy, and I'm the author of this new book, Are You With Me? Kevin Boyle and the Rise of the Human Rights Movement. The book is a biography of the late Professor Kevin Boyle, who was a very distinguished uh, human rights lawyer and uh, activist uh, who worked on many issues, both in Ireland and around the world. One of Boyle's great causes was freedom of expression, and in the late 1980s, he was the founding director of a freedom of expression NGO called Article 19, where he found himself in the middle of the extremely tense clash uh, that erupted when Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini uh, condemned the British writer Salman Rushdie to death, uh, claiming that Rushdie's novel, The Satanic Verses, was un-Islamic. What I'd like to do today is to read a brief excerpt from my book that talks about Boyle's role in this controversy. I had hoped to be doing a reading like this in person at bookstores in Ireland and in England and elsewhere, but unfortunately due to the coronavirus outbreak that hasn't been possible. So I'm doing this uh, remotely sitting in my living room here in Hong Kong where I live. In retrospect, the Salman Rushdie affair would come to be seen as the opening salvo in what became an enduring theme of the years that followed, the clash between Islamic extremism and Western liberal democracy. In its passions and bloodshed, it was a foretaste of the mistrust, tension, and conflict that would characterize so much of the West's subsequent dealing with the Islamic world. It created a climate of heightened pressure and violence targeting both liberal thinkers in Islamic nations and critics of extremist Islam in the West. Rushdie's Japanese and Italian translators were killed. His Norwegian publisher was shot three times but survived. Liberal imams in Brussels were murdered. Bombs went off in bookstores in central London. Six days after Ayatollah Khomeini's declaration, Kevin Boyle organized an emergency meeting at the headquarters of the National Union of Journalists in London. In addition to members of Article 19, those in attendance included representatives from the NUJ, Index on Censorship, the International Writers' Organization, PEN, the Writers Guild of Great Britain, and the Publishers Association. Denouncing the FABA as, quote, armed censorship, they decided to form the International Committee for the Defense of Salman Rushdie and his publishers, with Boyle as the chair. For Boyle, who deeply believed that freedom of expression was a universal value which underpinned all the other freedoms he'd spent his life defending, the fatwa, the Ayatollah's death threat, was a threat that had to be resisted whatever the personal risks. There are times in all our lives when you wish it was otherwise, he wrote later, but you take up the challenge. A few days later, Boyle, the chair of Articles 19, Article 19's board, the writer William Shawcross, influential British playwright Harold Pinter, who in 2005 would win the Nobel Prize for Literature, Pinter's wife, the historian Lady Antonia Fraser, and a few others gathered in an ornate meeting room at the House of Commons. They decided to draft a letter in support of Rushdie and to seek the signatures of as many writers and intellectuals as possible before publishing it in newspapers and magazines around the world. It was crucial that the writing community, the literary world, should rally to Rushdie's defense, recalled Arya Nair, the founder of Human Rights Watch. Had that not happened, the impact of the fatwa and the physical attacks on people who were associated with Rushdie's book would have had a far more devastating impact on freedom of expression. Boyle took the lead in drafting the document. With the help of Shawcross, Pinter, and others, they reached out to as many Nobel Prize winners as they could. Within 10 days, they had a thousand signatures. There were five winners of the Nobel Prize for Literature, including Boyle's hero, the Irish writer Samuel Beckett. Seven others who signed would subsequently be awarded the prize, among them Kazuo Ishiguro, Doris Lessing, Maria Vargas Losa, and Boyle's old friend from Belfast, the poet Seamus Heaney. Other notables included Graham Greene, Norman Mailer, Elie Wiesel, V.S. Pritchett, and John Hersey. Significantly, a half dozen exiled Iranian writers signed, as did authors from Egypt, Tunisia, Jordan, Pakistan, and the United Arab Emirates, as well as from the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. It was a striking rebuff 
to the argument that freedom of expression was a purely Western notion. Although the letter itself was barely a hundred words, Boyle spent hours refining it. The document was very much a reflection of his values and sensitivities. On 14 February, it began, the Ayatollah Khomeini called on all Muslims to seek out and execute Salman Rushdie, the author of the Satanic Verses, and those involved in its publication worldwide. We, the undersigned, insofar as we defend the right to freedom of opinion and expression as embodied in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, declare that we are also involved in the publication. The next sentence acknowledged the strength of feeling against Rushdie. We appreciate the distress the book has aroused and deeply regret the loss of life associated with the ensuing conflict. To Article 19 staffer Matthew Piet, this was typical of Boyle. Kevin was very strong on issues of religious freedom because of his experience in the Troubles. He wanted to accommodate the fact that there were intensely held beliefs on the other side. I think that was signature Kevin. The letter contained two appeals. One was to world opinion, to support the right of all people to express their ideas and beliefs and to discuss them with their critics on the basis of mutual tolerance, free from censorship, intimidation, and violence. The other appeal was to world leaders to, quote, continue to repudiate the threats made against Salman Rushdie and those involved in the book's publication worldwide. On, second, on the 2nd of March, the letter was published in 62 newspapers and magazines around the world. A press conference was held in London to publicize the document. Boyle told reporters that its publication was an unprecedented event that gave an opportunity for writers all across the world to speak in one voice for freedom of the imagination and in defense of Salman Rushdie. Privately, he was thrilled. It was one of the world's greatest coordinated protests, he wrote years later. A thousand signatures. Think of the challenge of agreeing a statement and responding. The letter made Article 19 a voice for Rushdie, who remained in hiding, and Boyle became the public face of the campaign and thus a potential target. That took a hell of a lot of courage, Boyle's old friend Bert Lockwood deserved. He observed, he was quite visible. As Matthew Piet recalled, we were at risk because we were effectively representing Rushdie. We did receive threats. Although it didn't happen, there was talk of having a policeman stationed outside Article 19, the Article 19 office because it was quite dangerous. Yet Boyle never let on to his colleagues or his family that he was worried. Kevin would have handled that, Piet said. He was very good at protecting us from anxiety. Boyle's wife, Joan, had a similar recollection. Kevin was so swept along by the excitement and the effort of creating the initiative that I am not sure he ever felt in danger. I do not recall being particularly frightened. In July, Boyle organized a press conference held at the Institute of Contemporary Arts on the Mall in central London with Harold Pinter, Kazuo Ishiguro, the playwright Arnold Wesker, and Francis D'Souza, who would soon succeed him as director of Article 19. During the previous months, Article 19 had continued to collect signatures for the letter. Boyle showed reporters what was now a book-length document signed by over 12,000 writers and intellectuals from 67 countries. Despite the show of support, the news conference was a tense occasion. People were very jittery, recalled Francis D'Souza. Harold Pinter was very jittery about being photographed by the press because he might get targeted. Boyle read a message from Rushdie in which the writer, making one of his first public comments since going into hiding, acknowledged the number of letters of support he'd received from Muslims and tried to strike a positive note, saying the process of mutual understanding with Islam will continue, leading to reconciliation. It was a hope Boyle strongly shared. Throughout this process, Boyle had no direct contact with Rushdie, communicating again through intermediaries. The two men did not meet until January 1993, when Rushdie made a heavily guarded appearance at a conference on freedom of expression that Boyle organized in Dublin. Years later, Rushdie expressed regret at not getting, getting to know Kevin better, but remained deeply appreciative, in his words, of the efforts Boyle and Article 19 had made on his behalf. It would take almost a decade before post Khomeini Iran backtracked on the threat sufficiently for Salman Rushdie to resume the semblance of a normal life. 
but the religious and political fault lines exposed by his case became more acute. And the challenge of responding to terrorism and authoritarian governments in a way that preserved fundamental values like the right to freedom of expression became more complex. Even though the press conference was Boyle's last official event, both at Article 19 and as chair of the Rushdie Support Committee, he now handed both roles over to Francis de Souza as he prepared to resume his academic career at the University of Essex. They were issues that would remain central to, that would remain central to his work for the rest of his life. I hope that gives you a bit of a taste of Kevin Boyle the man and the kind of remarkable uh, experiences that he had throughout his life. Uh, in these grim times with so many of us stuck at home, I hope at least some of you will find it of sufficient interest to try and order the book and learn something more about this remarkable and inspiring man. Thanks very much for joining me.